monsters. They exist among us, and sometimes they win. Even the devil was an angel once. The world has its own rules, and these rules are not human. Some of us seek answers to the origin and existence of cryptids and the unexplained. Join us as we venture beyond the known and accepted boundaries. Welcome to our nightmare. I think you're going to like it. Hey folks, good evening and welcome to another episode of Phantoms and Monsters Radio where we explore the strange and the unexplained. I'm your host, Lon Stricker. Thanks for joining me this evening. So uh, if you enjoy our content, please subscribe, like, share our presentations. Uh, please feel free to comment as well. Uh, Super Chat will be active during the show, so please uh, show your support by clicking the dollar icon underneath the chat. Uh, you can also support the channel by clicking the Super Thanks icon and the Buy Me a Coffee icon. Uh, your consideration is very much needed and appreciated. So tonight, Steve Stockton is with me. He's a veteran outdoorsman and paranormal researcher who puts together collections of terrifying, odd, and strange encounters. He also references his own personal encounters with the unexplained. Steve studied English language at University of Tennessee, Knoxville, and lives in Portland, Oregon. His books include Strange Things in the Woods, a collection of terrifying tales, and My Strange World. His most recent series is titled National Park Mysteries and Disappearances. Now, from his early years, Steve has had what can be called strange and oftentimes frightening experiences with the paranormal and the unexplained. These encounters led him to search for the answers, only to discover the truth is and easy to find. His book, My Strange World, is a collection of Steve's encounter with his, in his personal life, as well as his life as a renowned paranormal researcher. Now, if you like scary stories and, uh, and to take a trip down the road of the unexplained and bizarre, then buckle up and get ready to dive into the strange world of Steve Stockton. And Steve's books can be found on Amazon.com. So, Steve, my friend, thanks for coming on this evening. Oh, glad to be here, Lon. Thanks for that introduction. I wish I had a better show for you now. <laughs> <laughs> now we're going to have some fun. Well, you know, what I'm going to do tonight, I'm going to open it up for the audience to ask you questions. And uh, But there is one question I do want to ask you, and that is, you know, out of all your encounters or and, you know, your investigations, which one of those sticks with you the most? Well, as, as far as the, the, the missing persons cases, uh, it would have to be the Dennis Martin case in the Great Smoky Mountains. Happened Father's Day, 1969. Uh, Dennis was just about a year older than I am, or was at the time, and um, we're from the same town, same Knoxville. And uh, he'd gone up there with his father and brother and grandfather to spend Father's Day in Spence Field, which is up above Cates Cove. And... Uh, Met another family up there, also named the Martins. One of just those little Fordian coincidences that happen a lot of times in these cases. Uh, no relation, I don't think. And uh, the kids were playing together. And uh, they were either playing hide and seek or trying to sneak up and scare the adults. Dennis's father watched him go around behind some brush. And uh, then later when the other boys came out, uh, no Dennis. And they said, well, we haven't seen him since we were playing. His father walked around the pile of brush, into the pile of brush, no Dennis. Uh, the grandfather took off down to the ranger station to get some help, and his dad took off in a run down the Appalachian Trail, which is just right there at the edge of Spence Field, and uh, no sign of him. Been missing ever since. And that case has always stuck with me. Um, now, I'd already had paranormal experiences and, thing by then, and things by then, but I, I really lost my innocence. It was the first time I realized that, yes, a kid can go missing and not show up, no sign of him, nothing ever found. I followed the local news uh, for years and, and clipped out uh, everything I could find. I still have a couple of scrapbooks full of stuff, but that one, more than anything, as far as a missing persons case, that, that sticks with me. That one haunts me. 
Well, you know, there's, and you and I talked about this. Uh, we had family that, you know, from that area. And, um, you know, you've mentioned to me that your great grandmother was full blood Cherokee. Mine was too. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've heard so many tales from up there in the Smoky Mountains from, from relatives. Uh, and uh, it's just a strange area. I mean, you know, you, people talk about, well, call, some call him the booger. Some of them call him wild men. My un great uncle used to call it a wild man. He used to mess with it still all the time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so, uh, yeah, the stories are, are, there's a lot of them that come out of there. You know, of course, you got people that, come across the, the Appalachian Trail and they come down and you hear lots of stories from them. <clears throat> but it's just a, it's just an interesting area. Yeah, the, the whole Appalachian Range starts in Georgia, goes all the way up uh, into Maine. And uh, I've never through hiked it, but I've hiked on a lot of it. And there's just some strange places, particularly in the southern Appalachians. And my granny on my mother's side, she was from the Cades Cove area, grew up there. And according to her, there was a haint or a booger in every holler. And mm. yeah, a, a booger could be anything. A, a wild man, some kind of weird cryptid. There was always a, some story of something. You had to be careful out there in the woods. And then on the Cherokee side, they had all kinds of legends and lore and shapeshifters, uh, things like Spearfinger, things like that, that uh, they would admonish you for even talking about. Don't, don't even speak its name aloud. You'll draw it to you. Don't even think about it. And uh, you get in trouble for some of that. But the Smokies in particular, you know, there's hauntings, there's Bigfoot sightings, there's other cryptids, there's strange disappearances, uh, just the, the whole gamut. Yeah, I, I, I know. It, it, it's been, it was difficult to get stories out of, out of the uh, First Nations people and the people in, in Cherokee. Um you know, very similar to what we experienced out in uh, the Diné Navajo Reservation. Uh, the older folks out there, <laughs> yeah. they, they will not talk about skinwalkers oh, or yeah. anything related to that. And it, you a know, little, little correction there. You said I lived in Portland, Oregon. I moved from there in July. I'm in uh, the high desert of New Mexico now, right in the edge. Oh, really? The Navajo Nation Reservation, the Diné. Um, I went in the post office the other day to mail some books off, had on a Bigfoot T-shirt. Navajo guy waited on me. He said, let me get some info from you. I've got some stories, I'll tell you. So mm. I'm looking forward to that. But, yeah, out here, uh, skinwalkers, uh, shapeshifters, a little bit of everything. The Four Corners isn't that far away. Um, Were well, you know. around Farmington? Yeah, I'm in, I'm in Farmington. Good, good oh, guess yeah. there. I just... Just a, a few miles south of uh, Durango, Colorado, and I, I love it up here. Yeah, I, you know, I promised JC so many times I was going to come out there and, and, and tag along with him. Just did, unfortunately, it just never happened. But uh, man, I'm telling you, some of the stuff had come out of it over the years, just unbelievable. And just uh, some of the the, the DNA magic. There was a infamous uh, serial or a murder, uh, just over the hill here in a place called choke cherry canyon i know back, what i back heard in the 70s. Yeah. you know about that one well mm -hmm. the, the kids that perpetrated that they were high school kids but they ended up killing a, a native a, a navajo dna person and uh they got off with a slap on the wrist and uh there was a, a shaman thought mm -mm, that ain't gonna happen put a curse on them every single one of them died under mysterious circumstances there's a really good book about that can't remember the gentleman's name but i believe it's called the circle Wow. Yeah. I'll have to look for that. I, I love, I love those stories. I love those. Uh, and, and I've been up there, Choke Cherry Canyon. Um, if you go to my band camp page, uh, bandcamp.stevestockton.com, I'm doing some spoken word over there. My picture that I used for that is uh, that was made in Choke Cherry Canyon. And there's just, there's a, an eerie feeling up there. I mean, not only you know, because of the murder, but just because of the other stuff. I've got a really good friend that lived here for a long time, went to high school here. And uh, she told me about an encounter she'd had where her and some friends are out near Choke Cherry Canyon one night. And uh, an old lady came up this dirt road, just, just booking it, a little old granny lady and uh, scared them out of there. They, they thought that was probably some kind of, there we go. Rodney Barker, the broken circle. I I'm going to have to look at that. Name. That is an excellent, excellent read. Definitely going to have to put that on my list. I gotta, yeah, I, I love those stories. 
Uh, you know, every once in a while, you can get one of the younger ones to, in, to entice them to talk about it. Uh, a story that came out of their, their grandparents or whoever, but... Uh, Older folks, nope, nope. Uh, uh, it ain't gonna happen. <laughs> I, I, I have tried, and it, it just is not gonna. It's just not gonna happen. So, um, it's interesting. I, uh, it, but I, I, you know, those years that I did work with JC and, and and listen to his tales and the things that he had been investigating up, and also some of the the, the guys who were with the uh, Navajo police and some of the cases they were involved with. It's, oh, it that, was that interesting. Navajo cops show, watch that episode called The Howler. Yeah. And that'll put, that'll stand the hair up on the back of your neck. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I have, I have talked to one of the guys that did that show and uh, JC said, that's absolutely true. He mm -hmm. said th they had been talking about that thing for years and years and years. And, um, well, it's just uh, there's just a lot of things that are unexplained. The, the fact that there have been so many residents, reservation residents, who have had encounters with Bigfoot and some of these these uh, even even cryptic canines, other than skinwalkers. I mean, you know, um, it's 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 interesting. I mean, and uh, you know, when I can get a when I can get a story like that, I look. Oh, I'm I'm looking forward to it. Uh, you know, that's the first thing that goes up. Yeah, definitely. And uh, that's the thing about Skinwalker. It's a shapeshifter. It can be anything. It right. can appear as a person, an animal, uh, some sort of weird creature. And uh, that's it's all throughout this area. And uh, not only the Navajo or the Dene, uh, but uh, the, the Ute, the sleeping Ute, they're just up the road going toward uh, Durango. Mm -hmm. And uh, they've got a lot of stories. Now, the, the legends differ somewhat, just more of a colloquial telling of it, but it's still kind of the same thing. It's they, They've all got those legends. Same with the Cherokee in the, the Smokies, the, the western band of the Cherokee there. They've got shapeshifters. They've got skinwalkers. They've got hairy giants. They've got little people, uh, a little bit of everything. Yeah, I don't think you can really find a, a First Nations tribe that doesn't have some type of folklore that's very similar to that. You know, around here, we have a few that from the old Susquehannock, that most of those died out pretty quickly or have gotten moved off. Uh, but there's been a lot of uh, a lot of Shawnee tales here, and of course, mm -hmm. they moved back down south into uh, into Ohio and West Virginia. But um, yeah, there've been a lot of tribes here, so we have heard a lot of different things over, yeah. the, over time. And it's it's nationwide. You go up into New England, uh, the Algonquins, they've got similar stories. Uh, when I lived in the Pacific Northwest, uh, the Yakima tribe, and there's another one there in Washington State. I can't remember, but they had the same thing with the little people and and uh, spook lights in the woods and hairy giants. A lot, a lot of uh, Bigfoot, Sasquatch activity in the Pacific Northwest. Only had one brief encounter where I saw something that I thought may have been a Bigfoot. It was. It looked like a person, but it was huge, and it was walking down a country road and uh, when it passed under a street lamp it had a, a sheen or a shine to it mm -hmm. and, uh, it walked past the stop sign i went up there because I, I first i was going to go after it and try to get a picture heard my granny in the back of my head saying you need to get in the house that's what you need to do <laughs> so um, the next day i went up there and, and measured where the stop sign was and whoever it was would have had to been seven or eight feet tall to see where I saw the top of their, their head, the domed head, you know, it just, it looked like a Sasquatch mm -hmm. and it was just, just walking down the road. I didn't never thought of anything like that. Uh, and then I saw a footprint uh, below the snow line up near, uh, I think that was, I was around the occult Washington that time uh, in the mountains near there. That was in the Gifford Pinchot National Forest. A lot of sightings there. I've uh, been up Mount St. Helens, uh, Mount Rainier, uh, Olympic National Park, Olympic National Forest. It's just, it's rife with him up there. Mm hmm. Absolutely. And folks, if you've got a question uh, in the chat, feel free to put it up there and uh, we'll, we'll get it over to Steve. You know, you, you talked about uh, around the, uh, up in New England, around what people call the, the Bridgewater Triangle, that area up there. You know, I think that one of the scariest incidents, I and I was young too. I was in my senior year of high school. We were up in uh, we were up in Plymouth, Massachusetts. We were doing actually a, an exchange concert up there, mm -hmm. and I, you know, I 
knew that I had some abilities that by that time. And uh, we, I happened to go out with my host that night. It was at night and uh, they were driving us around the, out in the rural areas. And we went over to Miles Standish uh, Park. Mm -hmm. I guess it's a state park. And I don't know what the hell it was that night, but we walked out. I, I tell you, I walked out there and I couldn't stand there more than five minutes. I had to get in the car. It was like <laughs> I've been I, in some places like that. And just yeah, it's like other my places God. up there in New England, the, the infamous Bridgewater Triangle, and there's also Bennington Triangle. I've covered some disappearances up there. And uh, there was one place in particular, there was a, a Bigfoot sighting a guy on the uh, stagecoach road had gotten the stagecoach stuck in the mud and was trying to get that taken care of. And some kind of hairy giant thing came out of the woods, peered in the stagecoach at the people, flipped it over and then screamed and ran off into the woods. I guess he didn't like their look. Mm -hmm. And uh, another interesting case up there, there was a person found that looked like they had been squeezed to death in the woods, a hunter that had gone missing. And then you, you hear a lot about boulder fields. Well, the, the Algonquin have a story of a creature that uh, can appear as a boulder. And when somebody passes by, it opens up and swallows you and then spits <laughs> you back out. Well, there's been cases where people that have been missing have, are found in a boulder field that's been searched previously. And they look like they've fallen from a considerable height when there was no place for them to fall from. Is that right? Well, you think about that. If some kind of rock creature swallowed you, smashed you, got whatever it needed out of you, and spit you back out in a boulder field, you might look like you'd fallen from a considerable height. You know, that reminds me of some stories I had gotten from an area around Cooperstown, New York, uh, where, and I had a couple people tell me about this. Apparently, there's a bluff not far out of town where people have actually seen the rocks open up and they've seen gnomes or fairies or whatever come out of these things and they they they're said to grab people i i think they have a couple of incidents where people have been supposedly taken just never returned mm -hmm. uh you know you do hear a lot of weird stuff like that up in these older areas of you know the older populated areas of the united states and new england in particular yeah a lot of a lot of folklore a lot of stories up there um out west too i spent some time on uh, mount shasta back in the spring oh yeah and Boy, that place, I, I was outside at about two o'clock in the morning and I'd already seen some lights way up on the mountain. Just, I don't know what it was. It was weird, but I'd gone out about two o'clock in the morning and I felt like I was being watched and I just wheeled around real quick and it was the mountain, the mountain. It feels like the mountains watching you up there. That's a strange, strange place up there. And they have those strange lights. They have the lenticular clouds, a lot of disappearances there. Tales of an Underground City, Lemurians, mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. the infamous uh, robot grandma uh, case up there where the little boy was supposedly taken into a cave. And it's just, I, I, I want to go back. I've got uh, plans to go back to Shasta this summer. And uh, it's just uh, that whole area the, the, around there, uh, Dunsmuir, Weed, um, McLeod. There's been all kind of fairy sightings and Bigfoot and, Strange creatures, a uh, mountain opening up, uh, people in white robes that they've spotted way up on the slope uh, with a telescope. And uh, one of the most interesting Bigfoot accounts I heard ever came from there. Uh, a lady claimed that she was there in the springtime and saw what she described as a female Bigfoot giving birth on the slope. And then another lady, totally unrelated, didn't know one another, didn't know about one another, a year later, she claimed to have seen a, a, in the same area a female Bigfoot nursing a baby Bigfoot. So there you go. One right? witnessed the birth. The other, so a year later, saw her nursing the, the baby. So, You know, I've heard a couple of tales from back in the late 1800s. I think it was around that time where people had would be on train, you know, uh, going around Mount Shasta and talk about seeing Bigfoot up on the mountain or out on the fields down on the downslope and stuff. Uh, yeah, I mean, there are a lot of stories. I mean, Mount Shasta is just bizarre. Uh, I've got a friend who goes out there every year uh, on a retreat, and uh, yeah, it's uh, he wouldn't miss it. It's some, yeah, it's, you know. just, it's compelling. 
uh, like I was coming down from Portland, and when you come down the I-5 and you first go around that curve where you can see Shasta off in the distance, it's just mm-hmm. – it's majestic, but it's it's eerie. There's just – there's some strange energy, some strange forces at work there. You go down into the town there, there's still a lot of uh, New Age shops, a lot of influence there <laughs> from some of the occult and medical metaphysical practices that were popular around the turn of the last century. But it's it's definitely – of strange energy there. Mm. Well, I do have a, some questions. Uh, AJK <laughs> asks, Steve, is your current house haunted? Yes. In fact, it is this very room that I'm in here. I've got, I've turned this into a, basically a broadcast house. I've got a live studio in the living room, by the fireplace studio A is in one of the middle rooms. That's where I do my audio recording. And then I've got this set up in here now for uh, live streams and stuff. Uh, there's a bathroom here to my left. Well, in the 80s, there was a lady that lived here that had terminal breast cancer. Uh, she decided she wasn't going to let it take her. So um, she took matters into her own hands and swallowed a bottle of something and mm. died in the bathroom floor there. And um, there, there's there's been some activity here. I mean, prior to me living here and since I've been here, and uh, well, I'll just I'll go ahead and tell the story. One morning I was praying. I'm a, I'm a Christian. I pray several times a day. I was praying and I heard this older female voice from this end of the house say, God gave me breast cancer. And that was before I knew the history of the house. Well, I hmm. rebuked that, you know, that that's not the way God works. And after that, it seemed to clear up back here, but there was a, a heaviness, a darkness in this end of the house, especially in that bathroom. I'm not sure how long she was there before they found her. And then uh, Sandy, the lady that I bought the house from, she's my channel manager and partner over on 13 past midnight. She had lived here and uh, she seen a little boy about eight or nine years old face to face. And uh, one night back in the summer, we were sitting out on the, the back deck patio area back there, had our computers out there. It's nice in the desert at night. And uh, I saw the, the kitchen curtain on the, the door there doesn't come quite all the way down. There's about a five or six inch gap a window below that. And I saw the top of some kid's head uh, pass through the kitchen. And also while we were out there, a lot of times the lights in both bathrooms would come on. And I would come in and it wasn't a short or anything like that. The switch would actually physically be flipped up and have to turn it back off. So <laughs> yeah, there, there's some things here now I've smudged. I, I believe that that part from my Cherokee heritage, I smudge, I use sea salt, things like that. And uh, haven't had any trouble or anything recently, but there was, there's definitely been some activity here. Mm. Yeah. You know, I can't say I've ever lived in a haunted house. I, you know, I don't know. I don't know if I'm lucky or not, but I never have, um, which is interesting. I, the place I live right now, I'm right beside a big Catholic cemetery, <laughs> and I haven't felt a thing. <laughs> and I've been here a while. Well, it's, it's St. John, the, the, the revelator, said that the dead don't come back, but sometimes they stay. Um, yeah. And I, I'm just the opposite. Uh, every house I've ever lived in was haunted to a degree or had some kind of right? activity. And I came to realization a few years ago, talking with a friend of mine who's uh, sensitive towards such things. She said, it's not the houses, it's you. Mm-hmm. She said, it's, uh, th- that activity is attracted to you. And for example, when I lived in Las Vegas for about 10 years, very, very active house there. My housemate, she didn't see or hear anything. I saw all kinds of stuff. She did have one experience that finally made a believer out of her. But uh, other than that, it all happened to me. <laughs> mm. um, got another question. Nancy Malcolm asked, do you think the number of Bigfoot, Fay, et cetera, are increasing? And if so, why? I, I do. I've talked to people about that. And for whatever reason and however you believe, the veil, whatever the veil is, the, the thing between this world and the next one, you know, there's certain times of the year that they claim it's thin, uh, All Hallows' Eve. That's that's one of the nights. But I've heard people say, oh, I'm sorry, my cat knocked something over here. Hey, don't, don't feel bad. <laughs> I got one too. But uh, I've heard people say that that veil is thinning and not just certain times of year or during uh, certain times of the, the, the moon or um, 
the equinox or uh, solstice or whatever, but it's getting thinner all the time. So I think, yeah, we're seeing more activity. We're seeing things ramp up. And again, I don't know if it's just that the uh, Internet, you know, has made the world a smaller place and we're mm -hmm. more aware of stuff or if, if it is actually I, I believe it's it's getting uh, thinner. I believe that what, what that person told me and the way they explained it to me, because everything's on the increase. You know, I uh, I, I kind of agree with that because uh, it, it's true. More people are talking about it. Less people are, are inhibitive about talking about it. They feel less chance of being ridiculed because it's way out in the mainstream now with the Internet and TV and such. And uh, I think because of that, the the veil may be thinning somewhat. It may be opening up more. And, I, I uh, think so, because there's been yeah. other times when there was like a, a golden age, you know, the spiritualism movement and things around the turn of the last century. People were aware of it. People talked about it. Uh, my granny on my mother's side, that's what they came out of. Uh, my mother was born in 1927. And uh, I'm a late in life, unexpected baby. But uh, when she was a little girl, her family routinely had uh, seances, held table tappings, used a spirit board or Ouija board. Mm -hmm. uh, my grandmother was a, a self-proclaimed gypsy witch. Now, I don't know where she got the gypsy part because she was from Cades Cove. But I'm thinking somewhere way back in the lineage, there was some old country that they came from. But uh, she uh, told fortunes, read tea leaves, coffee grounds. Uh, <laughs> different types of cards. She wouldn't touch tarot cards. She said there was something dark about tarot cards that she didn't like, but mm. they, they were into that whole thing. So I, I come by it honest on, on that side. But Yeah, uh, well, me too. I uh, I come from powwowers and, uh, you know, the Southern Root Conjurers and stuff. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's almost the same. You go up and down the Appalachians, you're going to run into all kinds of uh, folk yeah. healing and such. And, uh, yeah, here in Pennsylvania, it was the powwowers. I've had some relatives who and were powwowers. That was on my mother's side. Now, on my dad's side, uh, his mother, they back in the hills where they lived over on the Cumberland Plateau, Middle Tennessee, they called her a yarb doctor or mm. an herb, herb doctor. Mm -hmm. And uh, she also cut hair, pulled teeth. And ran the post office from her front porch <laughs> in uh, what used to be called Ben Stockton, Tennessee. It's mm. uh, annexed by Jamestown. It's part of Jamestown now. But yeah, the old family home there, uh, there was a, a like a Dutch door to one side of the porch. And that's where you could come do your business. I've still got the old uh, things that she used to cancel the letters with and the pen set that she had on her desk. But yeah, you come get your mail. She'd pull your teeth, cut your hair fix you up some kind of herbal poultice or something that either cure you or kill you. According to my dad, uh, one time I think they, they had, he and his siblings had the measles and she made sheep manure tea and made them drink it. And he said, you talk about something that'll cure you. He said, I, I didn't want another dose. He said, I, I will those measles to go away because I wasn't drinking any more sheep manure tea. So this, you uh, run into a lot of stuff like that. But she was wise in her ways, a lot of wisdom. She taught me that, you know, out in the woods, anything that will hurt you, there's something near there that will either cure you, heal you, or help you. Like if, if you get snake bit, there's plants that grow where snakes are that you can treat a snake bite with. If you get poison ivy, there's something that grows near that that you can put on the poison ivy. So there was, I mean, those people survived uh the Great Depression, uh, World Wars, the, the Spanish-American War, uh, those great influenza epidemics and, and pandemics that happened back then, they had something going for them. Oh, absolutely. They lived, I mean, the absolute middle of nowhere. It was miles to town. You know, my uh, my grandparents all grew up during the, uh, during the Depression and even before that, and uh, it's... Uh, some of the stories you hear and you, you think, you know, even, you know, you hear that term, the great, the, 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 uh, uh, the greatest generation. And there's something to that because those people put up a lot of different stuff. <laughs> Little, you talk about World War One, then the Spanish flu, then the depression. And, you know, it's like, oh my God, they, you know. Yeah. And, uh, the, the, my dad's family, uh, he, it was almost like the, the potato famine over there. He said there was, days and weeks that potatoes was all they had to eat he said they ate so many potatoes that all the tumble bugs over there had heartburn but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but 
but uh, <laughs> occasionally, you know, they they were farmers and uh, yeah. uh, crop farmers, grazed tobacco, hogs, uh, cattle, things like that. And uh, he, he said he remembers one time that all they'd had to eat was potatoes for a long time. And uh, his dad, Poppy, they call him Poppy, sold a calf. And I uh, went to town and came back with uh, sacks of flour and meal and uh, bacon and all this stuff that, uh, I mean, they had animals, but they, they didn't process the meat themselves. They just sold the livestock. So they, they had mm -hmm. it rough. I mean, and uh, electricity, they didn't have electricity till my dad was in elementary school anyway. And even then it was a series of batteries that looked like uh, fish tanks. I've got one of the old batteries and I've they, seen ran, those. they could yeah. run uh, maybe one light bulb and the radio. They would listen to the Grand Ole Opry and stuff like that, whatever they could pick up over there in the mountains. Wow. But, uh, I can't imagine. They didn't have running water in that house until um, probably sometime in the 80s. There was a, a, a well outside that you could, you know, the old the pump handle that you could draw water from. But uh, after my dad's last brother passed away and my cousin moved in over there that's in, sometime in the early 80s probably around 83 mm -hmm. uh, before they had the, the house plumbed so though that was a hard scrabble existence and uh, oh absolutely i mean i've heard so many things and um you know thank god for our grandmas and grandfathers because some of the stories we have been told i mean you really appreciate what you've got after hearing what they've gone through and and how they became successful in life and had families and it, it is it it's um and you know I, I will cherish all that i mean you know especially yeah. my grandmother my grandmother told me and she insisted that i knew the family history she lived to 103 mm -hmm. and uh born born the year of the titanic and <laughs> the titanic sinking <laughs> and she uh she did. She she made sure that her grandson was going to know about the family and, you know, both, all sides of the family. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. And my, my I, grandmother I'll, I'll Sheffer, on my mom's side was that way, but not so much with the family history, but all the folklore, the superstitions. Mm -hmm. um, I was her favorite child. Uh, she had 10 kids, uh, nine boys and one girl, my mom being the only girl. So I had a lot of cousins because each one of those boys was married at least once, some of them multiple times, had one uncle that used to say uh, he'd been married uh, six times to seven women or seven times to six women. And he said that was the only mistake I ever made was marrying the same one twice. It sounds like you made more than one mistake there. <laughs> uncle. But uh, out of all those cousins, uh, I was born mm. with a veil or a call over my face. Now, all oh, that yeah. is, it's the afterbirth, the amniotic sac. My mm -hmm. grandmother was there for my birth. Uh, my mom, they'd given her twilight sleep and she was out of it. But in my granny's superstitious eyes, that marked me as a special child. You're supposed to oh, have absolutely. Second sight and all this. So out of all the cousins, all her grandchildren, I was the one. And uh, go to her house, she'd take me into her sewing room. She lived in a big old Victorian farmhouse. And uh, take her, take me into the what had been the uh, dining room, big uh, formal dining room. She turned it into a sewing room. Uh, in the wintertime, she'd sit in there with one of my aunts and, and piece quilts. And uh, she would get me in there by myself and and make me tell her back, you know, whatever story she was telling me, the, how to avoid bad luck, how to get good luck to you, all that stuff, you know. And, and I was afraid of her, to be honest with you. When I was a kid, she looked like a witch. She had arthritis, so she's kind of humped over and hands are kind of – and uh, – but uh, she passed away when I was 13 years old, and I mm. wish I'd had another 13 years to spend with her. I'm, I'm working on a book about her and some of the things she told me and some of the things she said. But she knew things she had no way of knowing. I remember one time we were going to visit her, and there was a, about 25 miles away. And there was a house we had to drive by where years and years prior, uh, a kid was playing in the yard, chased a ball out into the street, tragically got ran over and killed. And... Uh, my mom had told me that as a cautionary tale and just had pointed the house out to me at one time. Well, every time I drove by there, that house, I'd just feel, get to the weird feeling, you know, that little tingling in the back of my head. And uh, one day we were headed to her house and I was laying down in the back seat reading a comic book, wasn't paying any attention to where we were at. Felt that little tingle. I looked up. Sure enough, there's that house 
where that happened at. Mm. My grandmother's, you know, and then a little while later, mom, dad are carrying stuff in. She whisked me off to the sewing room. She's told me uh, something or other about the feelings, feeling things. And, um, and I'm like, well, well, yeah, I was about eight years old. I said, well, yeah, I got feelings. I get my feelings hurt and stuff. She said, no, I don't mean like that. She said, I mean, you feel things like that spot on the highway on the way here tonight. And my jaw just dropped up and it's like, she's in my head. She can read my mind. Scared the, the pee water out of me. You know, I just mm-hmm. I didn't, didn't, didn't like granny being able to, to know my thoughts, but she knew about that. And I had other people tell me stories like that. Uh, uh, lady that I'd met much later in life after my grandma was passed uh, told me that when she was a teenager her and some other girls around the same age 14 15 went to see my grandmother to get their fortunes told had to walk several miles out to where she lived and uh, the two of them were really into it they wanted to find out if they were going to marry well and stuff and this particular lady said ah, I'll go along with you and hear what she's got to say but I, I don't believe in all that crap well they, they get there they come into my granny's reading room and she kind of looks at him and she says, I'll read for you and I'll read for you, but you I won't read for because you don't believe in me. And uh, the lady's name was Anna. She said, you could have knocked me over with a feather. She <laughs> said, there was no way. She said, we were walking, you know, down the old dirt road, country road, miles away from where she lived when I uttered those words, but she knew what I had said. And mm-hmm. there you go. So that, that was wow. my granny. I was, couldn't put nothing past her, of course, having nine boys. Same with my mother. She had nine brothers, and so she knew all the boy tricks. I didn't get away with much. <laughs> yeah, I was spoiled, too. I mean, my grandmother had me, me, a grandson, and four granddaughters. And, uh, yeah, I'll admit I was spoiled rotten. But, you know, I got more tension, and uh, I was better for it, I think. So, absolutely. Yeah. I was a, a late in life, unexpected baby. My only sibling, the older brother, he was 17 years older than I am. Uh, and by the time I was cognizant or anything, he'd already married and moved out. Uh, mm. My nephew, who's four years younger than me, he was like my little brother. My little, my actual brother seemed like an uncle or something. We weren't closer to much, much later in life, but uh, my dad used to kid me because, you know, they knew my brother was getting married, moving out, and he'd think, you know, you were supposed to be a 63 Corvette. <laughs> they'd, <laughs> they'd had plans, and after my brother moved on and they were empty nesters, they were going to buy a, yeah. a 63 Corvette. Uh, Route 66 was a popular TV show back then. Yeah. They wanted to travel the highways like Todd and Buzz. Well, surprise. And he, mm. I think he was only half kidding when he said that. But if I had done something in particular that he didn't like, he'd laugh. And he'd say, bring oh, it you up. You were supposed to be a Corvette. <laughs> 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 but I was I was raised as an only and therefore was was totally indulged. I was spoiled. My brother used to resent that, I think, because he was born in 46. So he came up kind of rough just after the war. My parents uh, worked together out at Oak Ridge, Tennessee, met on the Manhattan Project. Uh, my dad worked at a Oak Ridge National Laboratory mm-hmm. later on as a scientist. And, and that was a weird mix, too, where we lived out in the country, uh, lived in Knox County. Oak Ridge was just across uh, Melton Hill Lake, used to be the, the Clinch River till TVA dammed it up. But uh, at one time, PA, uh, Oak Ridge, Tennessee, had more PhDs per capita than anywhere in the world. And then, like, where I went to elementary school, is a small country school where my mom had gone to. Uh, 200 kids total, first through the eighth grade. You had uh, children of uh, physicists and, and rocket heads, and then you had kids that their dads farmed tobacco. You know, so it was just a, a strange, odd mix. But just the stories that, that that you would hear. Every everybody had a story. That school was supposedly haunted. I've, I've got a story about that in my book about the mm. uh, my. Uh, not entirely legal incursion in there one night while it was still a school. I didn't go there anymore, but uh, something chased me and a friend out of there. Mm. Uh, yeah, I want to thank the folks who have uh, given donations and, and uh, super chats tonight so far. Appreciate it. Very much appreciated. Uh, now, let's get to another question here. Uh, do you believe, Steve, in the Bigfoot UFO connection? I, I do to an extent, just in, for the fact that a lot of times 
in areas where there are a lot of Bigfoot encounters, that there's a lot of UF, UFO activity as well. And there have been times when people have seen Bigfoot uh, either shortly before or shortly after seeing a UFO. So mm -hmm. I think there is maybe some correlation there. That's one of those things that's hard to say. But I think everything, paranormal, strange, supernatural, I think it's all connected to some degree or another. Yeah, I tend to agree with you. You know, different aspects of the paranormal, there's a fine line between all of them, I believe. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the more and more you do this, and you know, uh, you go into a case thinking you're going to have one one thing and you're going to get a whole slew of things as as you go deeper and deeper into it. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, that's that's just the nature of the beast, I suppose. And uh, one of the ways that that's fascinated me in the last few years is the faith theory. I'd never put a lot of credence in that or a lot of thought into it until I started looking into it mm -hmm. and reading some of those texts from uh, 1800s in the Celtic countries where the, the belief in the faith was almost a religion and probably still is mm -hmm. in uh, parts of Ireland and places like that. But uh, some of those old stories, uh, the, the fae is kind of the umbrella of which everything can fit. Uh, there was one account I was reading from, uh, I think it was mid-1800s, where they talked about a horseless buggy came down out of the sky with some little men in it. Well, that's a UFO story. Mm -hmm. They talk about some of the fae. They're not all this Tinkerbell, Disney-fied things that we've been to, uh, convinced that uh, they are. There's they're some of them that are big and scary. They're almost like elementals and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I think that's the only theory that I've heard that kind of neatly puts everything together in a box and ties it up with a bow. But is is there something beyond the Fey? And a, a lot of those uh, Indian stories and legends and things, that ties into the Fey too. Some of the same types of encounters that the natives here have. I think, it, again, it, there's there's a connection there, string theory or whatever you want to call it. Uh, there There's a thread that runs through the paranormal. Yeah, and we've got more and more researchers and investigators involved with Fey research and uh, and that. It's, it's becoming more prominent now, which uh, is good because it's something that really wasn't covered yeah. by just and a I'm few years. And I'm glad people. to see it. Just a few years yeah. ago, uh, ardent Bigfoot believers, hardcore UFO enthusiasts, even abductees and experiencers, they would kind of snicker at you if you mentioned the Fey. But now they're kind of saying, hmm, you know, maybe there is something to this. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, Vince has put up Joshua Cutchin's book, and he, is, he and Timothy Renner have been writing about that for the last couple of years and such, and it's been some really interesting research and, 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 and cases that they've come up with, and I'm glad it is happening because, it you know, it's opening up everybody's mind, and yeah, I'm, you're right. I think there is a, a definite connection between a lot of what we people experience, a lot of what we investigate. Uh, yeah. that is related like that. Definitely. And that's, you know, Charles Fort said, one measures a circle beginning anywhere. Well, yeah. that, that circle can include a lot of different things within it. And some stuff just outside the circle, the, the overlapping circles, you know, that sort of thing. There's part of this, part of that. And it's the same with those missing person cases. People ask me, what do you think it is, Steve? I think it's it's a whole bunch of different things. I think there's human predation. There's serial killers out there. There's simple death by misadventure, being ill-prepared or ill-equipped or overestimating your abilities. Uh, but then there's cases where something took those people, whether mm -hmm. it be a UFO, some sort of government entity or um, a program or, you know, another cryptid or beast or I, I don't know. They're just they're, the, the only answer is there is no answer at this point. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. You're right. And, you know, that's that's what I found. And you, you mentioned that in your intro there that I'm, I'm no longer looking for for answers. I'm looking for the next set of questions. Uh, Soraya Ascath over on Where'd the Road Go, he, he compared mm -hmm. it to uh, uh, the paranormal is like trying to put together a jigsaw puzzle, but you don't have the picture on the box to even see what picture you're supposed to come up with. And then you find out some joker has maybe mixed in five or six different puzzles. And uh, there you go. Have fun. And I, yeah. I like that analogy. That is a good analogy. Uh, let's see. Vincent wants to know, 
do you use crystals or other things like sage to clear your area? And I guess he includes yeah, I, other divination and stuff. Yeah, as well. I'd already mentioned sage. I use that. Yeah. Uh, I smudge often. I do have crystals. I believe in the power of rocks and gemstones. Some people try to poo poo that, but to look at a, a, there's a watches that have a quartz movement in them. When I was in the scouts, we made what they call a foxhole radio with a, a quartz crystal a nail, a piece of copper wire, a razor blade, and a thumbtack, I think. And if you hooked it up just right, you could actually pick up radio signals. Absolutely. There's power in uh, not only crystals, but lots of different kinds of rocks and things. And uh, I believe like the, the stone tape theory and things like that. You think about that, an, an audio tape or a video tape, that's just a piece of mylar plastic with ferrous oxide particles on there. When it runs across the playheads, it does whatever it does to those heads or the recording head. The playhead plays it back. I think there are residual hauntings and things that that's what that is. There's uh, one of the oldest hauntings I've ever heard of was a man in England that would see Roman soldiers marching through his basement. And uh, I forget what type of stone the walls were. They're probably granite, uh, but something with the, that had a high quartz content in it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and he did some research, and sure enough, the level that his house was on, that was the old road through the area when uh, those, those Roman soldiers would have marched through there. And he said it was always the same. He would see the same apparitions doing the same thing. And you have that at Gettysburg and places like that where it's like a loop, just a continuous mm -hmm. loop. And, and there's a difference between those residual hauntings like that and intelligent active hauntings or poltergeist or, or whatever you want to call it. So I think there's a lot that, that science just hadn't figured out or that we don't understand. Uh, things we're not meant to understand just yet. I mean, if, if you look how much technology has grown just since we were kids, wow, uh, what, what will the next 20, 40, 60 years hold? I, I probably won't be around to see it, but I'm sure it'll be amazing. <laughs> yeah. And if you're ever in the area, I mean, I live just down the street from Gettysburg. Uh, make sure you let me know. Cause I, you know, Oh, I'd love to I, meet I, up I would... with you. I kind of have plans to go uh, the, the next bash. I know Cisco Murdoch is big on that. She's invited me a couple of times. Uh, my girlfriend lives in Indiana. She wants to go. So I'm thinking it's not, it's still a good drive, but I can fly into Indy, pick her up in a rental car, and we'll we'll take off to Gettysburg for the the, the bash or whatever they call it. I'm I'm unfamiliar, with it. <laughs> but uh, Cisco Murdoch, uh, Journey Through the Gate Paranormal Portal podcast. Her and her crew, uh, they rent uh, a bed and breakfast, a haunted bed and breakfast, is just right near uh, where everything takes place. And it's uh, probably is it the Farnsworth Inn. That sounds familiar. I, I yeah. can't say for sure, but it's it's something like that, and it's just yeah. right there. Yeah, that place is haunted. I'll agree. I, I I will attest to that. Uh, I have seen a few things in that place and felt a few things. So absolutely. And in fact, that was there when most haunted was there when they were here in the United States about a decade ago. I was there with them, and uh, God, that was that was that was one of the strangest things I've ever been with because we all up in the attic and all. Mm -hmm. And I was helping with the helping the crew. <laughs> that was that was an interesting night. But no, absolutely, that place is definitely haunted. Yeah, no, that, to me, that that's a fun time. That's that's a great date right there to, <laughs> to go stay in a haunted B and B and then tour a haunted battlefield. I'm all about it. There you and go. I've, I've often wondered about that. And I'd like to get your opinion on this. What huh? is it in particular about the Civil War battlefields? Now I've been all over the world. I've uh, I spent a year in Southeast Asia. I've seen uh, the killing fields there in Cambodia. I've been to Vietnam. I've been to uh, some of those uh, areas in France uh, where World War I, you know, the trench warfare and all that happened. And it, it has a, a certain feeling to it. But I've been to a lot of battlefields, Civil War battlefields here in the States. Mm -hmm. There's just, there is a difference. I don't know what it is. Uh, Chickamauga in Georgia, Fort Oglethorpe down there. And they've had all kinds of terror stuff there, uh, old green eyes. But there were people that claimed to have seen that floating around during the battle amongst the dead and dying. Yeah. Uh, Snodgrass Hill, that, that tower there, that whole place just gives me the creeps. But I, I think it has to do with the times itself. 
I think, and you're right. I mean, every, I've been to several field battlefields, and there, there's a, a specific type of energy there. Um, and you know, it so a lot of it's residual, but there is some r- very active activity, and I think it has to do with the time. I think, you know, these people for the most part. They were, it was a civil war. They were brothers. They were, yeah. you know, these were people whose families fought the revolutionary war, the, the Mexican war together. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think because of their, what they believed in, and I think they just fought really much harder. I, I, I think they were more committed to the battle. And I think a lot of that has what, you know, left the imprint on the field itself. Yeah. And, and I agree with you there because it was the first time that Americans had killed other Americans on American soil. And it was literally brother against brother in some cases. Uh, I had family on both sides during the war and I depended on uh, who you talk to and and how it was. But um, there's a a story I've got over on 13 past midnight about a place up in uh, Johnson County uh, um, near Mountain City. We talked about Roan Mountain. It's near there. Place called the Jingling Hole, and mm-hmm. it was where that uh, one side or the other. Once they captured prisoners of war, they had a an iron bar laid across a some sort of an open cave or open pit or shaft or something, and uh, they would that was their punishment. They would have to climb out there and hang off that bar, and then once they let go, that was the end of them. And the ones that rode horses had spurs, and you would hear the spurs jingling supposedly to this day if mm. you go there you can hear moans and cries coming down there and still hear the jingling of spurs but there's some places up there where there's still a lot of animosity still some family feuds because of who picked what side on the war exactly i mean, I mean people exactly. that are blood kin that don't speak to one another haven't spoken to one another since the civil war there's some of those mountain feuds you know the the hatfields and mccoys that's that's a real thing in, in exactly. some of those little mountain areas like that. Yeah, between the West Virginia, Kentucky side, you had all. I mean, those. Yeah, it was the same here because you had you had families in Maryland who you know the brothers. One would be on the Union, one would be on the Confederate side, and many of them actually fought each other at Gettysburg. So um, yeah, I mean, and another thing, I don't think people were prepared for how much of a loss of life there was going to be and how exactly the fighting actually was. I remember one time my brother showed me a picture. It was just, it was amazing. It was some people up on a kind of a bluff and they were overlooking a battlefield. Absolutely. And the, and the lines were drawn. There was a, a unit over here of one side, a unit over here, the other. And these people in their Victorian finery are having a picnic. They've got a blanket spread out there. They've got baskets and stuff. And then in the next photograph, those people are gone. The picnic baskets turned over down below <laughs> where they were watching. Yeah. There's like bodies and, and dead and dying people yeah. down there. And you wonder, what did they think? Was it going to be like a football game or something? And there was going to be a, just a little skirmish. But no, these were people being killed right in front of you. And they, they hightailed it out of there. But. Yeah. I mean, you know, you hear the stories about, you know, after – uh, Fort Sumter, you know, they thought, well, you know, especially in the Union side, they thought this was going to be some some walkover. And, of course, when they started mustering in, in D.C. and went across the chain bridge into uh, Virginia over at Manassas and over first bull run, well, you had people from town, from D.C. area, with picnic baskets and, and carts and, and, and buggies and stuff, and they were going to watch the battle. Well, that didn't last for so long because the Yankees got their asses run out of there real quick, and they were rolling up on these people in the buggies. Mm-hmm. So uh, that wasn't unusual. <laughs> well, I just again, I don't know what people expected, but it was it was a surprise, <laughs> and I think just the you know, just the loss of life, and not only from the battle, I think probably just about as many people died from uh, dysentery or from uh, being operated on. Uh, oh, yeah. It was uh, terrible. I went to a, a museum in Tennessee one time that had some instruments, the surgical instruments that were used during the Civil War. It was brutal. I mean, like hacksaws and bone saws. And uh, they literally, you know, the biting the bullet, they would give you a bullet or something to bite on. There was no real anesthetic. I think they might have had opium or something like that. But, yeah, they, they'd cut you off uh, – cut off a limb, cauterized as best they could, dig a bullet out of you if it was where. 
Uh, my dad's uh, mother, one of her brothers was a civil war vet veteran and he had one of those lead mini balls embedded in the back of his skull. It is has penetrated right? just enough that it stayed there, but not enough as far as I know to cause him any permanent damage. But she said she can remember giving him a hug and, and, uh, putting her hand around the back of his head and feeling that the, the remains of that mini ball in there. And if you've ever seen those slugs there, I've they're found huge. them before. They're huge, but to get smacked in the head and walk away with it, that's, that's something that's a, he's got, got a thick skull <laughs> and, and happy of it, I guess, in that situation. Yeah. I've heard all kinds of stories. I, there was one guy in particular. I, I, I just heard the story the other night. He got shot right between the eyes up in, up in the, um, up in his forehead. And he, that hole stayed open all his life. And, um, you know, they'd left him for dead. He shows up across the lines back on the union side. And, uh, he was from Illinois actually. And, uh, he lived his entire life up until the, he was in his early nineties, I think. And, uh, he three on three occasions, parts of that mini ball broke off and popped out of the, out wow. of the wound, but the wound stayed open. But a trephination by a musket. You know, the ancient Egyptians used to do that. They'd chisel a hole between the eye there, supposedly right. open the third eye. And uh, so that guy had it done <laughs> as a battle wound. <laughs> There's pictures of him with that hole in his forehead. So, yeah, I, I was kind of surprised by that. But what, I've covered true crime cases before where somebody got shot in the head and the bullet would actually travel around the curve of the skull and, and exit the, the skin on the other side. I mean, you talk about lucky. That's amazing. I'd go buy a lottery ticket if, if I got <laughs> a shot in the head and the bullet skimmed around exactly. the skull and went out the other side. <laughs> uh, Amy wants to know, Steve, do you still astral dream? I That's one of those things I think I do. I, I believe in dream travel. I believe that happens. Uh -huh. Now, I've dreamed some really, really, really weird dreams uh, I'm lifelong insomniac. I don't sleep much at all. Maybe two or three hours a night if I'm lucky. Mm -hmm. And I don't go into the different levels of sleep. I go right into REM sleep, uh, rapid eye movement. I'm dreaming sometimes before my eyes are closed. I'm already seeing it in my head or wherever it is that you dream. But there's some places I go to that I've been several times that are familiar to me. And I'm, I'm somebody different, but the people there seem to know me. They've never called me by name, but there's places that I go to. And then some of it's modern, some of it's older, but there, there's one particular place that I go. I'm going through a, a pass between some mountains and there's a couple of different convenience stores there. Well, there's a little service station on the right that I always stop at and get a cup of coffee. And if I go up a road just behind there, there's a house that I'm familiar with up on the hill. Now, it looks like uh, my cousin's house over in Fentress County, but it's not their house. But it reminds me of that house. I've been up that road a few times. I don't know what that's all about. But there's yeah, a, a, some know, familiarity in some dreams. When I was a kid, I used to dream about a house where I had to, to walk down the long hallway to get to a door at the other end. And there was about four or five doors on each side. Some of them were open. Some of them were closed. And I knew that in some of those rooms, there was something that was going to get me. And I had to get from one end to the other and something would always chase me. And I never made it out the door. The door would either be locked or I'd wake up. And I was talking to a friend of mine, uh, Susan Woodcarver. She may be in the chat here tonight. She said she had had that same exact dream since childhood. So again, maybe that's just some kind of anxiety dream, some kind of mind game or something there but i've i've and i've dreamed about places that i've never been and then gone there and it was just like i saw i remember one time when i was a kid i dreamed about a place in ohio it was a farmhouse there were some little outbuildings and three of them and each one was in just a little worse shape than the other and out behind the house there was a swing set well i'm uh, probably a preteen was driving through ohio with my parents my parents uh, had an antique shop they're antique dealers and some summers, instead of going on vacation, well, they'd just take a buying trip and hit these estate sales and farm auctions and things like that. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, I just this place just seemed really familiar to me. And I'm, I'm talking about, yeah, just up the road, there's a White House and there's three buildings and there's a swing set in the backyard. 
And I'd never been there before. And my parents let me know that real quick. We've never been through this area and not with you, certainly. And sure enough, we went around a curve on whatever state highway we're on. There was the farmhouse. There was those three outbuildings. And once we got past the house, there was a swing set in the backyard. I dreamed about that years prior. Now, what does that even mean? I've, I've had stuff like that where I dream about something that like exists. precognition or something like that. Yeah, and, that's and weird. I used to ask my granny about that. And she mm -hmm. said, well, there's some things that you're meant to see. And the reason may or may not be obvious to you, even in retrospect, you may never know. But she said, sometimes things are meant for somebody else and you just happen to see it. It may not mean a thing to you ever and wasn't meant for you but because of what she believed I had that I was capable of, of seeing stuff that other people were meant to see. So, you know, take that with a grain of salt, but it kind of makes sense because that would explain I've had some, some premonitions some flashes of things, uh, some tragedies even, but no way to stop it. Mm -hmm. uh, I, one time I had like a, I just fallen asleep and I had this incredible dream. I was on a construction site somewhere. I knew it was in the South because the red clay mud I was on a job site. There are people walking around with their flannel shirts and their boots and their hard hats. And there was a, a pyramid of uh, pipe there, like the concrete pipe about, Oh, probably each pipe was three feet tall. There were five of them or six of them in a pyramid. Mm -hmm. And I thought, man, that's unsecured. That's dangerous. Mm -hmm. And about the time I thought that in the dream, the pyramid pipes collapsed and I, they rolled over a guy. I mean, I saw these pipes go down a hill and mash a guy just into oblivion. And I, I started up in bed and uh, my girlfriend at the time said, are you okay? You look like you've seen a ghost. And I said, I think I just saw somebody become one. But again, I couldn't identify the area. I couldn't tell you when, where, other than I believed it was in the South because of that red clay. Sure enough, a few weeks, a couple months later, whatever it was, I heard of a news account. It was in Tennessee in a, not even a neighboring city where that exact same thing happened and unsecured a stack of pipes broke loose and crushed a man to death. Wow. Why would I even see something like that if I can't prevent it? But again, goes back to my granny said, even if you know things, there's some things you can't change. They're going to happen no matter what you do or try to do. It just is. That was some of her, that, she, that was her, one of her catchphrases. It just is. I, I think she was right. Yeah, yeah. I, I've heard so many different things like that, and I think they do occur. Um, Carol wants to know, do sprites talk to you when you are sleeping? I guess that's uh, kind of tied in. Not, not that I'm aware of. The, the okay. only sprite I ever encountered was in the woods as a child, and it chased me, scared the daylights out of me. I couldn't see it, and I didn't know what it was, but uh, I'll just I'll go ahead and tell that story. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, in, it's in my book. It's called The Thing in the Ditch. And uh, we lived out in the country when I was a kid. I was eight years old, wandered around. We had 26 acres out there. Had a, a, about five of it cleared off. The rest of it was old growth forest. And uh, there was an old ditch line uh, to one side of the property. And uh, I didn't know it at the time, but that had originally been the old stagecoach road through that area, but dating back to the, the Revolutionary War and probably before. Mm -hmm. And uh I just, I played in that ditch and the other end of it, but I was on the upper end of it. And uh, my brother used to keep uh, hunting dogs and he had a dog enclosure up there that hadn't been used in years. And it was kind of just rusting into the ground. And I, I walked up into that ditch and it was probably 10, 12 feet deep, kind of looked down in there, didn't see anything to hold my interest, turned around, started back down the hill. Well, all of a sudden I heard something down in the ditch in the leaves and I turned around and looked and whatever it was came up over the lip of the ditch and was headed straight for me, but there was nothing there. I couldn't see it, but I could see the effect it was having. The tree limbs were being brushed out of the way. It was kicking leaves up when it's wake. I could feel footfalls. It was big, whatever it was. Well, I turned tail, ran down the hill screaming and cried. I was probably probably a quarter mile, eighth of a mile or something like that from the house. It seemed like a long way. And uh, mm -hmm. I was making such commotion. My mom came out on the back porch to see what was wrong. I ran past her and went in the house and hid. Mm -hmm. But um, when my dad and brother got home, uh, she got me calmed down. By then I recounted my story. You know, was it a deer? Was it a bear? No, I knew what all those things were. I'd seen all those things. This I couldn't see. 
But mm-hmm. uh, they went up there and looked. They could see where something had broke tree limbs and kicked the leaves up. Uh, no idea what it was. Well, uh, I just stayed away from there. I did lure a, a kid that came home with me from school one time. I got him to go up there and stand. He didn't know why. I'm like, Johnny, go up there and stand and look in the ditch and tell me if you see anything. And I head back down the hill behind a tree and watch. So he didn't know why, but he's just like, doop to do. No, don't see anything. Didn't chase him. Didn't bother him. Nothing ever got after my dad or my brother. And before I was born, my brother had hunted in those woods before we built a house on the property. Well, flash forward, uh, I'm 15 years old at this point. We had sold that property and we're getting ready to move to a, a new house that my father, folks had, had built. And I was just out walking around the woods, exploring some of my old childhood haunts. So I spent a lot of time in those woods. I taught myself uh, woodcraft and, and wood lore and things like that, learned to identify plants. There was ginseng that grew there naturally and uh, knew what to stay away from and, and what was really neat. There was a bee tree and uh, a little, almost like a cave. It was really just a hole in the side of a hill. Um, but um, I walked back up to the ditch and I'm just kind of chuckling. I'm like, wonder what scared me all those years ago. Of course, at that point, it had been about seven years. And uh, turned around, walked away. Sure enough, I hear that noise again. Turn around. Here comes that thing out of the ditch. Can't see it, but I can see what it's doing. Now, I didn't run screaming and crying that time, but I didn't waste any time getting back down the hill. And that was the last time I was ever there. We moved away from there a few months after that. Well, flash forward another uh, six years or so. I was probably 21 or so. I was working at a place in West Knoxville. And um, a guy that I worked with, only knew him from work, invited me to a party after work. So I went and it was at somebody's apartment, a bunch of people there. I didn't know anybody except the guy that invited me and didn't really know him. And uh, some girls that were there found a, a Ouija board either behind the couch or under the, the couch. So they decided, yo, let's do this. Mm-hmm. So they're, they're going around the room. They're asking questions. Came around to my turn. I thought, boy, I've got a doozy for you. And this is exactly what I said word for word. What scared me as a child? And uh, the Ouija board, they're, they're doing its thing there. It's figure eight. And it spells out W-A-T-E-R-S-P-R-I-T-E. Mm-hmm. They looked at me. I just shrugged my shoulders. They're like, water Sprite? Is it, is it thirsty? Does it want to drink a water? Does it want a Sprite? So I left it at that. Well, this was in the days before the internet. The next day I had off, which I think was the next day was the reason why I went to the party anyway. But I went to the big library downtown and I went up to the reference library. And I said, what can you tell me about a water Sprite? Well, she goes off into the stacks, comes back with some books and uh, she brought out some stuff and it was about uh, like elementals in the Fae. There are mm-hmm. spirits and, and I always get it confused, but there's either a naiad or a dryad. One of them is a guardian of the trees. The other is a guardian of the waters. Mm-hmm. Well, this particular property that we lived on, there were seven natural springs there. Six of them flowed out of hillsides. A seventh one was an artesian spring. They all flowed together into a bigger creek, which flowed down into the, the lake that used to be the river. So it would be the perfect place for a water sprite or a water spirit. Now, why it got after me and chased me out of there, who knows? But that's that's as good an explanation as I've ever heard. Well, and it came a from one. a Ouija board from people yeah. who had no foreknowledge at all of what I was even talking about. And it all fit together. That That's in my book there, My Strange World. Huh. Um, here's, a, here's an interesting question involving your cat. Do you... Catheda asked, uh, is your cat aware of or in tune with the resonant ghost in your place? I, I think they are. I definitely think they are. One day I was sitting in the living room and I could see down the hallway. And at that time, Sandy and her husband were still here. She had uh, seven cats. Five of them were black. They had a dog and uh, my dog Mulder was here with me. Well, I was sitting in the living room by the fireplace and I watched and every single animal one at a time, came down the hallway and looked into the, the doorway of the room where I'm sitting now, walked back, and it's like they, then another one would come down, but every mm-hmm. single one of them individually. And that, that was the weirdest thing. And even now, uh, Mulder's not too happy to be in here. He didn't want to come in here and uh, didn't want me to shut the door, but I finally got him to, to lay down. And then 
one of the cats is still in here. There's actually two cats here now. One of them's not mine, uh, but watching it for a friend. Um, Lieutenant Dan, he's only got three legs, but uh, <laughs> he, he goes everywhere. But uh, Benton's, uh, the, the, that's a, from a Forrest Gump, if, if yeah. nobody gets the reference there. But uh, Benton's, my <laughs> black cat that I got on Halloween as a birthday gift, she doesn't like it in here. Now, she'll come in if the door's open. I had to shut the door because she likes to come in and walk on the keyboard and climb on me and climb on the back of the chair. I saw one of your cats up there earlier. but Yeah, I uh, got that's, one. That was a that's move. A, first cat I've ever had. My mom didn't like cats and was afraid of them to some degree. And she was superstitious enough. I couldn't have had a black cat regardless. So my first mm. cat, now my daughter had cats when she was younger, but this is my first cat, black cat named Bittens. But yeah, she don't like this room either. None of the animals are too happy with it. Well, I, I tell you, I've had cats all my life, and they are the weirdest damn creatures. <laughs> I mean, they, 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 they do some strange things. And, and then I've seen two or three of them sit down here at the end of the hall and not in this room, but looking up in the hallway, looking at something that's yeah. not there. That's I went what and they looked. do. There are flies, there are moth. There's nothing no. there. There's only three of them, three of the black ones. And they were watching whatever it was. And then all of a sudden they just ran back down the hallway. So yeah, cats are so strange creatures. I, this I cat, my cat, Vinny, my cat, uh, I, I got him. When, I had two dogs when we got him. And uh, those dogs used to sleep on the couch. So he'd get up on the top of the couch and uh, he'd be looking around and you could watch his eyes like he's following something coming to the sofa. Yeah. And he's seeing something. And as he's looking down at the dog, the dog jumps up off the couch like something startled him. This cat saw something and he's done. He did that. He's done that all the time. I see him do it all the time. Now the dogs have passed since then, but he does some weird things. Yeah, and uh, my dog, the only the real shadow person encounter I've ever had, it happened at a place I was living in Oregon. Um, I was walking into the kitchen one night, and I saw what looked like a shadow, but there was no person there. Just the shadow came out of the laundry room, across the kitchen or across the dining room, through the kitchen and out the wall, which would have went into the garage. Mm -hmm. And my, my dog was with me, and he saw it. He didn't growl. He didn't bark, but he was wagging his tail like, oh, who's this? He thought it was somebody new. But the lady that, that lived there, she was a widow, and her husband had died tragically in a car crash. And she said, oh, that that's my husband. He visits here. He usually likes to play with the electronics. But uh, I've seen this, this shadow too. But I, I saw that just as, as sure as I'm sitting here looking at you. It was a, the shadow of a person, and it walked through the room and out through the wall. That's I've, mm. I've seen some other partial shadows and some black misty shapes and things like this. But this was the only clearly defined outline of a person I've ever seen like that. Wow. But I didn't, I didn't feel scared or feel any fear off of it. It was just like, wow. And like I said, Mulder, he he was happy to see whoever it was. So there you go. Mm. Uh, Davy Jones Locker asked if you've ever had an angelic encounter. Um, I believe so. I mean, it's one of those things you don't really know whether it was or not. But uh, I was uh, sitting outside a church one night. Um, a friend of mine was in a, an AA meeting and uh, they'd asked for a ride and I, I dropped him off there and I was waiting outside and uh, it was in downtown Knoxville. I could take you to the spot today as an old church. And um, I was listening to some guy on the radio, uh, one of those radio preachers, I think it's Bob Larson or somebody like that. You remember mm -hmm. him that, mm -hmm. Uh, the satanic panic and the backwards mm -hmm. casting and all that stuff that tells you how long ago this was. <laughs> and uh, so I've, I've been watching my park where I could see the, the, the door of the church where they'd be coming out of. So I'm sitting there watching downtown Knoxville. It's late at night. Uh, it may be dangerous down there now, but it wasn't then. But uh, all of a sudden there's this guy right behind my car. And, and that night, the guy I was listening to, like I said, I believe it was Bob Larson. He was talking about angels. And I was just like, mm, I wonder. And then all of a sudden, there's this guy who just appeared right behind my car. And he, he, he walks around to the window, and he asked me for some money. 
And he said, I know a place I can get a chicken dinner for two dollars. Well, this this is in the 80s. I mean, even in the 80s, I don't think you could get a chicken dinner <laughs> anywhere for two dollars. Well, I reached in my pocket and two dollars was exactly the amount of cash I had on me. Mm -hmm. And I gave it to him. And I do this when I when I give to somebody. I said, now you asked for this for food, and I'm going to give it to you in the name of Jesus for food. If you spend it on something else, that's between you and your maker. I gave it in a giving spirit. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he took the money, and he said, one more thing. He said, and this was in the summertime. He said, cold weather will be here soon. You don't happen to have an overcoat I can have, do you? And I'm like, no, buddy, I, I sure don't think I do. And I just, you know, made a show out. I reached behind my seat and put my hands on a raincoat that I had bought at Goodwill a while back and it just left it in the car. And I pulled it up and I said, how about this? Will this fit you? The guy put it on, thanked me, God bless me, walked around the corner of the church there, the, the end of the block. And I thought, that's weird. That don't make no sense. I mean... I'd, I'd even forgotten that overcoat was in the car. I reached behind my car seat. That's the first thing I put my hand on. It was in the, the floor. Mm. So I, I start the car. I mean, this guy had just went out of sight around the corner. I was like, I want to see where this guy goes and see about this $2 chicken dinner. I might want one of those. And uh, drove around the corner. The side of the church there, there was a park on the other side. It was gated and shut. They had the gates padlocked. That guy was nowhere to be found. Mm. He, not there. And I, I believe as I just been listening to this show about angels, this guy comes up out of nowhere, asked me for $2, which is exactly what I had in cash. And then asked for an overcoat, which I had and didn't even remember I had it in there and then disappears around the corner. I think that was my answer to the questions I was. Thinking I think it was about angels. Now my brother was a, a Pentecostal minister, a uh, preacher. And he had a lot of angel stories. I could I could do a whole show on other people's angel stories, mm. but uh, I believe they exist. I believe they visit us, and you know, uh, even uh, like in uh, the Mormon religion, some of those you have the the neophytes, the three uh, neophytes, I think it is, that travel around and and ask people for things. And I, I think there are people, whether it's angels or uh, spirits or whatever people, things that are put here to see how you treat people. Mm -hmm. I've often heard that that. Uh, if you believe in karma, that how you treat people is your karma and how they treat you is theirs. So I try to give everybody a fair shake, be nice to people, help somebody if I can, uh, like this missing persons thing. We anonymously donate to uh, Charlie Project, name us, any kind of a missing person fund to the families to help have posters made or hire private investigators or whatever. And again, that's all done anonymously. That's not the point of what we're doing. Uh, we're just there to get the word out. And our mission statement, if you want to call it that, if we can bring one person home or in the, the other end of that, give one family closure, then we're doing what we've been called to do, what we feel has been laid on our heart to do. Exactly. Now, the mystery side of that, we get into a little bit of woo over there on that <laughs> but, uh, missing persons that'll always be first and foremost the focus of the channel yeah i i'm a strong believer in angels um a lot of people who are in this check can tell you that and uh i i, I believe i've personally worked with them and i think I, i've got at least one strong one around me all the time so yeah i'm i'm a strong believer in it i believe that i believe you have guardian angels um I mean, and angelic beings. I don't know. I, I may believe differently than, than other people in the chat here. And again, that's, you know, no harm, no foul. Everybody believes what they believe. Mm -hmm. But, uh, I've, you know, I heard people say, oh, my, my granny died and went to heaven and became an angel. Well, the way I look at that, God created those beings, those angelic beings, and sends them out on specific tasks. Now, I'm not saying your granny isn't an angel or wasn't an angel in life or in death. But uh, I believe that people have assigned angels that are assigned to them, probably from birth or even before birth. I mean, the, the Bible says, uh, and God speaking, they say, even in the womb, I knew you. So if, if he knows you and he's going to send something to protect you, it's been there at least since you were born. And I think I've had some encounters that weren't angelic per se, but definitely divine intervention, where if I'd just been a minute sooner or a minute later, I probably wouldn't be sitting here right now. Mm. 
I've had yeah. some close, close calls. Definitely, like I said, divine intervention, a guardian angel, something watching over me. And mm. uh, I just, I don't believe in coincidence. I believe everything happens for a reason. Oh, and, I'm, I, I agree with you there. Like my granny used to say, you may not ever know the reason. And if you do, it may only be in retrospect, but everything happens for a reason. There is a plan out there. Hmm. So, um, Steve, why don't you tell the folks how they can get in contact with you, find your books, and anything else you want to tell them? Well, my books are available on Amazon or wherever fine books are sold. They're listed in books and print. Any bookstore or library can order you for it if they don't have it. Uh, sometimes I see them in the wild. I had a person send me a picture of one of my books. They found it in a Target in Florida. Now, mm. how it ended up there, I don't know. I'm still waiting for the Piggly Wiggly. Now, when my books make it into the Piggly <laughs> Wiggly, I don't know if you have those in your area, but when I was a kid down south, that was a big thing to get to kill the Piggly Wiggly. And I, uh, I don't know if you know um, Bigfoot and Non, Connor, but uh, he'll go and set up outside a comic book shop with a little table, just start signing his books until they figure out he's not supposed to be there and run him away. And one day... <laughs> I'm going to have a surprise book signing in front of a Piggly Wiggly somewhere. There you go. But there uh, you go. Uh, you can you can find them on Amazon.com, uh, and uh, I'm on uh, Missing Persons and Mysteries. That's uh, my main YouTube channel. Then I have 13 Past Midnight, and uh, I want to thank my partner Bill Melder for including me in Missing Persons and Mysteries. Without him, that wouldn't exist. Uh, we're just about to the quarter million subscriber mark and get around 2 million views a month. So Great. something for everybody over there. And then I've just started um, a band camp page where uh, people, for whatever reason, God help them, enjoy my voice. Uh, I'm doing some audio books and some uh, spoken word stuff. Uh, SteveStockton.bandcamp.com. And uh, going to be some fun stuff over there. And uh, if you want to reach out to me, I'm on Facebook. I've, I've got, uh, I'll be, I'm anybody's friend. <laughs> Somebody's called it the Hogly Wogly there. <laughs> well, wiggly, wiggly. I saw but uh, I'll, I'll you send me a friend request or uh, message me on Instant Messenger. I'll talk to you. Or you can email me. I love hearing from fans, friends, people with questions, people with stories to share. Steve Stockton, 81. That's the number, 81 at gmail.com and one of our favorite non-missing persons uh segments over there is called listener stories and the majority of those are, are some kind of paranormal experience bigfoot ghosts hat man dog man shadow people uh flannel man there, there's getting to be so many of them now it's hard to keep up well i'm telling you you're right <laughs> again that, so that, that may all get the thin lawn <laughs> Well, Steve, it's always great having you on with me. You're going to be on with me next Friday, matter of fact. Oh, yeah. We're going to have a, a special show, and I'm going to talk about that in a bit. But, you know, thanks again for coming on. It's always great having you, and uh, we'll be talking soon. All right. I look forward to it. Looking forward to next Friday night as well. Uh, I, I love being on your show. Love people that you associate with. Bernadette Daniel. I did, or McDaniel. I didn't know that. That was her inaugural show. I know. Yeah. She's part of your network there. I didn't know that was her very first premiere show ever, but she did a good job. I, I hope you're proud of her. She's she's a, a great girl, and uh, uh, I enjoyed my time on there. But anybody that you're associated with, Lon, is just uh, <laughs> top notch. Well, I appreciate and that. I'm, I'm glad to be a part of it, a guest in any way that I can. So thank well, you. For that. And thanks to everybody in the chat. Hello to all my people that are here. I love each and every one of you. I appreciate you. I see you a little farther on down the trail. Tiger Lily, love you, baby. My girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> you take care. Have a good weekend, man. Thanks a lot. Hope you get uh, continue on your path there. You're looking so good, my friend. I'm, I'm so happy for you. And uh, Well, I appreciate that. And thanks again. Thanks, everybody. Good night. So uh, if you uh, have a, had a sighting or encounter report uh, and would like to be considered for the personal reports of the Famous Monsters blog site, uh, feel free to forward to my email at lonstricklerfamousandmonsters.com. And I want to again thank Steve Stockton for joining me this evening. And uh, thanks to each and all of you for watching and chatting. Uh, if you made a super chat donation, it's truly appreciated. Your support's what makes all this possible. Please like, subscribe, and share, and please comment. Uh, now, next Wednesday, 
I'm going to present another Fams and Monsters personal report show at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. And you are all invited to the Creepy Christmas Cheer Show next Friday, December 23rd at 9 p.m. Eastern Time, 6 p.m. Pacific. We're going to have some guests and surprises. Steve's going to be on there. We're going to have Dean Burkham come on. Vincent and Bernadette are going to join me as well. So it should be a very interesting show talking about uh, creepy Christmas tales. So, uh, and also, you know, stay tuned because Bernadette's uh, show of a paranormal life is going to be on here following me at on Fams and Monsters Radio, 11 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Pacific. So until we meet again, stay healthy, have a safe, enjoyable weekend. Good night.